It's your open source advocate and I'm back with another video and today I wanted to talk with you about N8N. If you've been thinking about automating anything in your software setup and anything that you do with moving data around or anything that you do with trying to get one thing from one place to another that may be manual. Maybe you export a file into JSON and then you're converting that into some kind of CSV and then you're trying to move that over to another piece of software and import it or you're trying to put it into a database. I don't know. There's so many things that you could do with this N8N software that it's just amazing, but it really is a great way to automate a lot of the things that you might be doing manually today. It is really a click and drag. You need to know a little bit about the stuff that you're doing, but I'm guessing if you're doing it manually, you probably understand more about it than even you realize, and it might not be as hard to do as you think. And I'm going to use what we did a couple of weeks ago, if not last week. Uh, I'm going to use base row. So if you haven't checked out my base row video, you definitely should go do that. So I'll link that in the show notes in the description. But base row is a really, really cool, no code way to get data from users and put it into a database and do things with it and get notifications about it. But one of the best things it has is what they call webhooks. So I'm going to show you how to kind of create a webhook in NAN and then set that up to go out from base row and then we're going to basically take that data that we get on n8n and we're going to push it through to mysql so there's a few things we need to do to set up n8n to actually function and then we'll get into kind of the demo of how it works so first i want to go through the installation of n8n and we'll get into that right after this i want to say thank you to all of my subscribers and all of my patrons over at patreon seriously you guys make this so worth it for me to do these videos every week i really truly enjoy it and i just can't say thank you enough if you're enjoying these videos, subscribe. Let YouTube know that I'm doing a good job by subscribing to the channel. Plus, you'll get notified when I have new videos coming out. And finally, if you're enjoying what I'm doing, give it a like. Just click on that thumbs up, and that way YouTube knows that you like it, and they'll pass it along to other people that might enjoy my content as well. I really appreciate it. Thank you again. Let's get started. As always, with any of the open source projects that I cover, I want to talk about how they support the open source side of their work. So I want to go over here to the pricing page. I know some of you guys are kind of like, oh, he's going to talk about pricing again. But I really want you to look at this and think about what you're getting out of it for the money that you would pay. So if you do their cloud offering, so they have a cloud setup where you don't have to do anything where you're setting it up for yourself. And if you're thinking about this for a small business where you're trying to automate some processes or for an enterprise or anybody else, really kind of consider what this can offer you, not having to set it up for yourself. So there's kind of the starter where you pay $20 a month and you get 5,000 workflow uh, executions basically, so 5,000 things. So if you have a workflow that has uh, six items in it, let's just say, or five items, let's just make it easy, right? You can do a thousand of those things before you have to start worrying about going to the next tier. So if you don't do something a thousand times a month, you don't have to worry about going to the next tier. And if you do, then you can jump to the next tier. But you also get 20 active workflows. So you can have 20 different active workflows and you can have those things go off up to 5,000 times of basically how many executions they do. And the same thing here where you've got maybe $50 a month for the pro level or maybe you're even looking at the power user level where it's $120 a month. But look at the numbers that you get for this. So if you're really thinking about using this and it's getting out there and you're kind of like, man, I really wish I had a little bit more, but I don't want to run this myself anymore. I'm an IT person. I have enough to do then they have this cloud offering that's out there and it's really great. Now, if you're not interested in cloud and you want to download and do this self-hosted, that's what we're going to talk about today. So first of all, free. Check this out. Free. The desktop app is free. So they have a desktop app. I'm not going to show you that one today. I'm going to show you the one that you can set up like a server and have a web interface for. It's the way that I like to run it. But you can definitely download this as a desktop app and try it out and see what you think. And then you can always go kind of installing it as a server later if you want to. So they do have the option of using this and, and really kind of getting out there. Now, when I say open source, I want to be very clear because a lot of people call me out on things and it's, it's absolutely what you should do when I mess up. But I want to be clear that N8N was using the Apache 2.0 license, which was a, which is a GPL open source license. They weren't happy with the level of freedom that people had with that license, actually. So what they did was they said, we're going to, we're going to create our own license to give you a bit more freedom, a bit more flexibility in what you can do with the software. I totally appreciate that, but the license that they have is not absolutely considered an open source license by the open source 
world because it's not a, one of the normal open source licenses. It's, it's based off of Apache 2 with some extensibility added to it that gives you more freedom. So I feel like it's open source. I want you guys to go out and check out their license, read through it and see what you think and tell me if you think it's not. I totally get it if you think it's not, but I thought this was a great project. I wanted to cover it and I still want to cover it. And I reached out to N8N and they said, you know what? For covering our software, we're also going to give a discount code for your users. I don't get anything out of this. I get no piece of the action. I get no payment. I just, I make videos for open source software and great software that I think you guys should have and try out. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to ask if they'd be willing to give me a discount code. And he totally was. It was so great to hear back from him for him to say, hey, I will absolutely give you a discount code. Just make sure you are clear about what our license terms are. And, and I wanted to make sure you guys understand that they've gone a little bit beyond the Apache 2 license and extended that out. But there is a discount code at the end of the video. I'll also have it in the show notes and the description. So if you decide you want to get one of these paid offerings, you can save a little bit of money on that as well. And I'll talk about that later. Right now, I want to go over to the documentation because they have some pretty great documents. And we're going to talk about the self-host N8N. So we're going to jump over to their self-hosting documentation. And so they've got this hosting in 8N and they talk about a few things here, you know, installation on all of the different hosting options for N8N. Um, we're really going to look for the one where, that we want, which is Docker, of course. So they do have the overview, the desktop app, the NPM. If you want to re run it straight up on NPM, you can. They have cloud and then, of course, Docker. So we're going to jump to Docker over here. And they have this Docker installation page that kind of tells you like, hey, here's the things you need. Now they have some Docker run commands, which are fine. And if you just want to get up and running real quick and see what it can do, then this one right here will probably get you set. Um, now they have some alternate database options. I'm just going to do the SQL Lite today because I know for my home use, I'm not going to use it so much that I need a MySQL or a Postgres SQL running. But you do have those options as well where you can run Postgres, MySQL, MariaDB. You can just kind of configure that up inside of the actual Docker Compose file and have it run. You can run one that you have on your own already. It's kind of up to you how you do that. But as they move down, they show you here's like how you would run it if you were going to run it with Postgres. Here's how you would do it with MySQL. So just kind of up to you to set those things and you can set the time zone and some other stuff that you might want to set inside of the, the system as environment variables and, and all that stuff. So there's lots of different ways to do this. But what I've done is I've taken what they had as a Docker run and I've kind of extended that out to actually make it into a Docker compose file. Now, the other thing that we're going to need is a configuration file. So we're going to need a couple of things here today. So I'm going to I'm going to stray a little bit from their documentation, but not completely. The documentation is always a good place to go if you're not sure about something or if you have questions about why something is happening. So I'm going to click on the configuration side here whenever we start talking about that. And really, it's about how to set the configuration. So they have a lot of NPM uh, documentation here, but they have some other stuff here as well that you'll see um, kind of set up where you've got environment variables that you can go and actually set up and make easy. So they have basic authentication. If you want to set that to active, you can set it. Then you can set your user and your password here. And it'll do basically, you know, do exactly what it says. It'll do basic authentication for accessing your innate environment. Um, if you come down a little bit further, you'll see there's a Docker run dash LT and they show you a little bit more like how this all goes together and what you would do. And, and you can kind of put this all together yourselves. I'm going to have some stuff in the file that you'll see, and I'm not going to set up any of the doc any of the authentication today, but I want you to know that these options are out there. So you can set up configuration files. That's important. And knowing that these configuration files are out there is really important as well. So you can kind of come and copy some of this stuff. You can see what all of these different things are. You can kind of understand what they have for everything as far as the configuration goes. And then they've got a couple of explanations about what everything is. So that's really important for you guys to kind of understand that side of it as well. So we'll talk about the configuration file when we actually get into setting up the software. I wanted to talk really quickly about this because I think it's super useful for you guys to understand and know that this is out here so that you can extend on your installation from what I'm going to show you today. But I wanted to get you started with the basics and then you can add things to the configuration file. You can you can add things inside of the Docker Compose file or environment variables, and that way you guys have this information that, you, that you'll want to understand as you move forward. And we're going to go set this up on a new host. So I'm going to make this bigger for the guys on the mobile devices so it's easier for you to see what I'm doing. And I'm going to SSH into my machine here. Now, as always, I have a Docker folder, so I like to move into my Docker folder. And inside of that, I've got all of the things that I'm running on this particular machine through Docker so that when I back up this one Docker folder, all of these things get backed up. And I like to keep all of my volumes inside of these folders for these different Docker items so that I don't have to worry about where is it or where to go. I get it all backed up at once. 
So I'm going to create a new folder. I'm going to do mkdir-n8n. I'm going to cd into it. I'm just going to do an ls to show you there's nothing in there right now. All right, so now I'm going to create a folder called .n8n. That just means it's a hidden folder. So I'm going to do uh, mkdir.n8n. This just means it's going to be hidden. So if I do ls, you don't see it. But if I do ls-al, you do see it right here, OK? So inside of this folder, I'm going to create a real quick configuration file. So I'm going to do uh, cd.n8n, mkdir, not mkdir, nano config. And then right here, I'm going to put a real simple JSON object. It's just a, an encryption key, and it's, it can be really anything that we want. So I'm going to just copy this. So I've pasted in this nice little piece of JSON, and we're just going to fill in the quotes right here with a really long, strong password. So we're just basically going to go um, something really nice like that. It's got a nice, long, strong feel to it that's hard to break. And we're going to control O to save that thing, control X to exit. And we're going to do just a back, back one folder level. And we're going to do nano docker hyphen compose dot YML. And we're going to create our docker compose file. All right, we're going to just look at this uh, file here real quick. And basically it's a version 3.3 of the docker compose. And we're going to have this uh, service called N8N. The container name is going to be N8N. The ports that we're setting are 5678 mapped to 5678. If you, for some reason, have something already using your host port on 5678, you can change this to any unused port on your host system. So not the Docker side, but the host side, the, the actual machine you're running everything on. If it's used up for some reason, feel free to change the left side of this colon. You can do that. Don't mess with the right side. That is for developers and really only if you know what you're doing as a developer. If you move down on the environment side, webhook URL, this is what we want to call we're going to call this auto uh, and this is our webhook basically so that it knows where to point anything that we're creating with a webhook. We want it to create a webhook with this URL and then that thing can point to our N8N. So you can do this from the outside of your network, inside your network. If you set everything up correctly and route stuff, it'll work right. The important part here is if you're going to do this only internally and you want to use just an IP address, you can absolutely do that and you can make it HTTP instead of HTTPS. It's very much up to you how you set this URL up, but you need to have one that can be reached by the other machines that you might be calling this from. Finally, this next part is execution process is, is set to main. I'm setting this because in their forums, somebody was asking about their webhook taking a long time to bring over data. And, and it seemed like it was doing that to me too. So I kind of wanted to say like, what's going on? And I found this thread that they had already answered it on. They said that it's defaults to own like OWN. And if you change it to main, then that can make it work a little bit faster. So I've put in this environment variable according to their instructions. And then the volumes here, it's going to create a volume on this .n8n folder that we made already. And it's going to map that as home node.n8n. And basically it puts your SQLite database in there and some other stuff that it needs. And really you've got that map, so you don't have to set anything else up as far as that goes. Then it's going to pull down the image n8n.io slash n8n. And then of course restart unless stopped. So if you stop it on, on purpose, it won't restart. But if you don't, re if you don't stop it and then you reboot the server that it's run on, it'll restart on its own, which is what we want. So we're going to do control O to save control X to exit and we're set. Now we should be able to run this and just bring it right up. So we're just going to do docker hyphen compose up dash D and that starts the, starts the server running and runs it as a daemon. Now I like to do, um, oops, docker compose up dash D and then two ampersands and then docker hyphen compose logs dash F. So this second part just says when this runs and gets everything up and running, show me the logs. And I just like to see the logs on the first time that I run it to make sure there's no errors, no weird things happening that I have to fix. So I'm going to hit enter. This is going to go out and pull down the N8N stuff. Now this went very fast because I've run this previously just doing some testing and some, uh, some other stuff. So it may take a little bit longer for you, but you will see something like this where it says, OK, you can access this thing through this URL. We don't want to run it through localhost. We want to actually access it through an IP address, but that's fine. So we can switch back over to our browser here and we're going to do HTTP colon slash slash and we'll put in the IP address to start with just to make sure that we can reach N8N. If you get the little spinning dots, that's a good sign. We're ready. Now we could go ahead and set this up. 
Um, but I don't want to do that yet. I want to go set up my reverse proxy so that I can actually give this thing a full domain URL of auto.routemehome.org and get an SSL certificate for it. So we're going to go, we're going to close this tab for now and we're going to go open up Nginx Proxy Manager. Now, if you're not familiar with Nginx Proxy Manager, this is a way to actually say, hey, I need a request for a certain URL to go to a certain machine on my network. So Nginx Proxy Manager sees that request and says, okay, I can grab that and send it to whatever machine you want. So we go into Nginx Proxy Manager, we're going to add a new host and we're going to call this auto.routemehome.org. That's routemehome.org is a domain that I own and I have that domain pointing to my public IP address on my home network. And then the IP address that I want that to point at is this machine we just set up and the port is 5678. So we can just hit tab. We're going to say block common exploits and allow web sockets and we're going to hit save. So first thing we want to do is make sure that auto works. So we're going to click on auto, make sure we get to the page, which we do. That's great. So now we're going to close that. We don't want to do anything yet. We're going to go back to this entry. We're going to go all the way to the right, click on the three dots, click on edit. And then we're going to see this again. We're going to go over here to the SSL tab right here. We're going to click on request a new certificate. We're going to say force SSL and I agree to the terms of service for Let's Encrypt and make sure my email is in there and I'm just going to hit save. Now this is going to work for a minute and try to say, okay, Let's Encrypt, I want a, a valid SSL certificate, challenge my domain. So it's going to say, let me see if I can reach your domain, which is why we set this up in the first place and just tested it. So we made sure we could reach it. Let's Encrypt says, I reached it. I give you an SSL certificate. Go ahead and try it again. And you can see here it says Let's Encrypt now instead of just HTTP only. So when I click this, it's going to go and it's going to run over to that thing and it's going to say, hey, I can reach it on SSL and here's my little lock icon that tells me everything is working the way we want. So that's good. So now we can set up our user. I'll zoom this back up a bit for the ones on the mobile devices. I'm going to use my email address. You would, of course, use your own email address. And then first name, last name, and my password. We'll give it a nice strong password there. And then we're going to hit next. Now they just want to know a little bit of information about how you're going to use N8N. For me, it's really as, you know, what kind of developer are you? You can kind of put whatever fits for you. But for me, I'm, I know enough to be dangerous. And then what kind of company and down here, I'm really not using it for work. This is just for me for home. So then it gets rid of the other fields and we hit continue. And then it tells you, okay, you should be set up. And we're just going to say, get started. So first thing out of the gate, they have a nice video here that will walk you through the basics of N8N. So if my video is not enough, which it probably won't be, they have a really great video series of things that show you how to do all kinds of cool stuff in N8N. So today I'm going to get into the bare minimum basics of what you can do with it to kind of show you how it functions. But really, this is the place to get started and make sure that you know what's going on. So if you go down here to your initials, I'm just going to click on my initials and you'll see that there's settings and then there's sign out. I'm going to click on settings. So right out of the gate, you can see you've got your name, your email address, everything like that. You can change it. You can change your password if you want to change your password that you set. You can also go to users and you can add other users. So there is an option. Now it tells you, hey, you don't have SMTP access set up yet. So we didn't do that. You would have to know your SMTP credentials and go set that up inside of your configuration file. And there's information in the documentation on how to do that. It's just adding another section and, and going in and setting that up. It's really, really straightforward. But then you can say invite. Now you see it gives you a, a, a thing because you can't send an invite if you don't have email set up. But, but be aware, there is the ability to invite other users. And then finally, the N8N API where you would create an API key so that you can access the API if you want to as well. So that's it with settings. We can go back and we're back at our main interface. And really, we've got some pretty cool stuff here that we can do. But the magic happens when you say, you know what, I want to create a new system. So I'm going to get rid of that. I'm going to move this start one over here. They've got all of these little plugins that you can run with and they've got different things. So they've got all. They've got regular and then they've got trigger events. So you can kind of check that out, but I just leave it on all and usually look for what I want to know. So let's say I wanted to send myself a message on rocket chat. I can start typing and you see they've got a rocket chat plugin already set. So when you click it, it's going to come up and say, hey, I want to see what, what your rocket chat information is. I need to know where, you know, where am I sending this 
First, you have to set up credentials for anything you're going to do. So if you're going to do Rocket Chat in this case, you would click here and you see there's no credentials. So I would say create new. Now I can put in my user ID for Rocket Chat, my auth key for Rocket Chat, and the domain that I use for Rocket Chat. So I'm running my own server, so I would have my own domain and of course my own user and my own authorization key or password. Okay, and once you've set that up, then that shows up in this drop down list anytime you want to set up Rocket Chat, you've got it. And if you've got multiple Rocket Chats, you can have those and you can tell it which one you want to send it to. And now you can get messages about things that are being triggered inside of N8N. So that's pretty cool. So when you do these things, it'll tell you like, hey, there's nothing coming into this to share any data yet. So just be aware of that. So you can always go back and fix that stuff too. So I'm going to go back to the board here. So I'm going to take out the Rocket Chat for now. It's just something to kind of show you guys that you can do that. So you just click on the little thing and you delete it, you're done. So we go back over here. We've got a lot of things, but webhook is a really great one that I want to show you because again, so again, it comes up and it says, okay, let's set this up. We're going to create a webhook. It's a get, so, and it's running on your test URL. So first you get this test webhook to be able to test all of your scripts with and make sure that things are running. When you're ready, you can say, you know what? I want the production URL and I'm going to switch it to this. And then you can go set that in whatever application you're using to kind of get that data. But first, starting with test is great because you can see the data coming through and it only runs for a couple of minutes. You can see that data is coming through. You can switch it when you're ready and then it'll kind of constantly run once you start the application listening all the time. So it's a good way to work. Authentication, if you need it, you can set that up. Get is the type here. We can change that to something else if we want to. So you could change that to post or anything else, but it's really up to you what you set that as. The you, the, so the path, this is kind of this little end piece. So if you don't like that and you're like, boy, that's ugly. I don't like that. I want to, I want to call this, you know, two dash rocket dash chat. That's what you can do. As long as it's not used, it doesn't care. And you see it changes immediately up here. And now that's the webhook path that you have. And it makes it a little more clear what this thing is doing. So if you see it inside of another application, you can be like, oh, okay, this is going to send it over, you know, to NAN to go to rocket chat or something. And then you can say, you know, how do I want this to happen? I want it to reject anything immediately if it can't do it or respond immediately. I want it to give it a 200 if it's able to, to be able to reach, which is great. And then you've got a few other things down here that you can generally not mess with. I haven't had to. So webhooks are super easy to set up and it makes it really easy to use other applications. So we're going to go into my other system that I have set up and we're going to kind of check that out. So let me find it. Uh, I kind of lost my page. Here we are. Okay, so I've got this one that I've been working with, and it's really coming from base row. And then basically it comes in from base row with this webhook. So I'm going to show you the webhook here. And I'm going to zoom this up so you guys can kind of see it. So basically I did this webhook test poll. Okay, and I said, you know what, I want to, I want to grab this thing. I've got it on a testing node. And I basically said, here it is. It's, it's, there's nothing there as far as like the, the, the authentication stuff, but it's a get. It's a get request. And then here's the name. So I changed it from that real long random thing to just test pull because that made more sense. And then immediately 200. So just like I showed you all ago, now right here I can hit listen for a test event. So that's where base row comes in. So I'm going to kind of move my tabs around so I can find things a little bit easier. I'm going to go to base row over here. I'm going to show you guys what I set up in base row. So this is already zoomed up a bit. I've got this thing called content length poll. It was a real simple one that I just created real fast in, in here. And you see here, I've got this poll results where I've kind of been filling it out to test. And then I've got this, um, I've got a webhook that I created already. So you can see I've got the webhook here that I've already created. And now I could create a new one if I didn't have one, but I'm gonna hit details so you guys can kind of see what's going on here. So the first thing I had to do was give it a name. So add a result. That's really easy for me to remember. And then here, it just kind of says, what do you want to do? So I want to use the field name. This is auto checked. I don't uncheck it. It's a get request. Remember that. And then I go over to N8N and I say, you know what? Give me this. It's copying it every time I click. So you can see right there, it copied it. So I did it like three times because I'm going crazy. And I can come here and I've got base row. I can delete that and I can paste it in. And there it is. It's got my URL. That's great. And then now here I could say, send me everything. So if, whether somebody adds, deletes, updates, I want to see every single thing that happens, send it over. But in this case, that's not what I want. I just want it. I'm going to say, I just want to know when you've created something new in base row, send this webhook message. 
And then this kind of gives me the format of what it's going to look like over when it gets to N8N. Now, this isn't exactly what it looks like. It'll, of course, have data in it, but it's close to what it's going to look like. So I can kind of see that. And then I can name additional headers and values if I want to. But this is this is all I need. And then when I'm done with that, I hit save and it's really ready to go. So now in NAN, I've got this thing set up and then I also created a form. So if I go click on my form and then I click on the, the URL that I have here for it, uh, I can just go and I can hit paste and go to my URL. And then I'm going to kind of make this where you can see what's happening, I hope. All right, so I've got this poll. I'm just going to check the thing. So, you know, what do I like? I prefer short length or long content. I like long content. That's what I make. That's what I like. I am subscribed and I get all of the notifications and that's it. I hit submit and it says, OK, thanks. Now I send this thing to listening. I should have sent it to listening beforehand, but there we go. I got the data anyway, so that's awesome. And you can see what I got here. And really, this thing is saying, hey, we got data and we see the output. So now I can go back and this is this is loaded. This is the output that it sends. So it sends this JSON that's kind of hard to read and kind of ugly. OK, but don't worry. We're going to go back and we're going to scroll up and we're going to move over a little bit if I can. I'm going to click on this one that says when I get that webhook data, I'm going to click on this guy and it says, hey, I see that webhook data that you that you sent me. I'm just going to say go ahead and execute it again and look for it. Yeah. So with this, I've told it, hey, I want to get this data and make it look better. So I just, I got this one that's called a set node. And right here, you just go through this and you click and you say, hey, what values do you want? And it's got these nice little gears. So in this one, I just set the name of it and I said, you know what? Um, this is going to be called short content. So there's the label. And then what field do I want? I want to know if it's true or false. That's what it's telling me is happening. So right here, if I, if you click normally and it's not already set, I'm just going to say reset value and you can see it's not on. I'm going to say, let's go tell it what value we want. I'm going to add an extension. And then I'm going to go click and it's going to just dig into this node and it's going to say, hey, here's the import data. Here's the JSON data. Here's the Boolean. Here's the body. And then I want to get values. So I'm going to drop this all the way out. And you can see here all the things that I got. And that one was called short content. And you can see that it's false. So I'm just going to send it over. And it's going to say, oh, OK, I see what you want. Now, I don't want it to be called false. I want it to actually pull in that data. So I'm going to get rid of that first one right there. Now, it's telling me here's the actual value that it is. But here's what I'm getting. It's that content. So I didn't have to type any of this out and understand this. I just I just go through and select it. Now, once I've got that, I can close this. And there it is. And it's showing me what I had. So I like long content, which is true. Now, I did the same thing. I just added another field, called it large content. And then I clicked here and told it, let me add a value. And I, I did the same thing. Click down through all the things to get to values. And I picked large content and it said true. And you get rid of any of the excess stuff that it has. So I also said that I'm subscribed. And I also said that I look, that I get all of the notifications. So this brought in this data for me. This is the next node. So basically, this is what's happening. I'm going through in test step format. But it came into the webhook. It passed it over here. This saw it and said, let me separate that out. And now I've got this MySQL node. So I've got a MySQL database that I'm running and I've given it my my details. And I created again, just like I did with Rocket Chat, I created one called MySQL account and it's got the account on it. And then I told it what database to use. And then over here, I basically just tell it here's the table that I want it to put stuff in. And here's the the things that it should be putting in there. And really, again, it's it's very much just kind of type and drag and it's very straightforward on how to do this. And then if I run this, we should see, yes. So we get everything and it says, hey, here you go. This is what it's going to do. It's going to put your zero. It's going to be a one affected row. So it's kind of giving us the output from a SQL system that says, hey, here's the things that happened. And you can see that right here and see like, hey, this is going to actually do this and send it over to the table. So what I've done is I've started with base row. So I started with base row and that's in another browser. Let's switch over. OK, I started with a base row and I said, I want to create an input form that grabs that data. Now, base row keeps this data for me, which is great. But I want to take this and do something with it later for my SQL. Maybe I want to set that up with um, something like Metabase and look at the statistics of it. So I, I say, you know what, I'm just going to take that and I'm going to send it over to N8N. So from base row. It goes over here to N8N 
and it comes into this node that's called a webhook. From that webhook, I just add another node called a set node, and I import that information from that webhook, and I tell it how do I want that information to actually look. And then from there, I say, now let's send it over to MySQL. Okay, how do I want that information to go into MySQL? And I create a table over there, and I tell it here's where I want this data to go. And then right here, all I got to do is just put the data in. You can even create the tables from N8N, and they have a nice tutorial on how to set that up as well. But this is very straightforward once you've got things really kind of set. So N8N just makes a nice, simple way to kind of set that up. Now, remember what I said about testing and production. So I can go here now and get my production URL. I can copy that. I can go back over to base row and I can say, you know what, let's go back in here and let's go back to the web hook. Let's go to the details and let's change this URL to my production URL. So now I've got the production URL in there. I'm just going to go down here and save. There's nothing to change. I can close that and then I can go back over here to N8N and I can go over here. I've got production set up. This thing's ready. It's ready to go to MySQL. I'm going to tell this thing to activate. It's going to tell you workflow activated. You can now make calls to your production webhook URL and then these executions will not show up immediately in the editor but you can see them in the ex execution list if you choose to save executions. So it's just letting you know like, hey, this is going to be a little different. You could kind of see things live whenever you did it earlier in test mode, but not now. So I'm going to go back to my form. I'm just going to reload this guy and I'm going to fill it out again. So this time I'm going to say, let's say I like uh, short content. I'm not subscribed and I don't get any notifications. I'm going to hit submit and it's going to go. All right, so as I was making this video, I realized whenever I send over the data and it tries to send it over to MySQL, something about N8N doesn't like the false values here for these Booleans, and it just removes them. So I had to go in and actually write a little SQL to, to make it happen, but and then we brought that over into MySQL. Um, so I just had to do a little bit of weird rearranging there to get that to happen, and I'll kind of show you my, my database here, but you can see here I got you know, blank for faults and then true for short content, blank for faults again, and then some content here. And basically I just had a little expression where I had to set these as strings instead of trying to bring them in as booleans. And, and then I set them up as, as varicares in here. And, you know, so if we, if we look at this, it's got zero. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase this. I'm just going to truncate this table. And now if we look at it, I'm just going to show you that there's no, no values in here, zero. And if we actually go do a select, it's going to show you there's nothing in there. Okay, I'm going to go back to our form and I'm going to refresh it real quick. We're going to go here and we're going to check a couple of boxes. So I'm going to say I like long content. I'm subscribed and I'm subscribed for everything. There we go. I'm going to submit it. Oh, I didn't enable it. So I've got to remember to do all my steps. So I got that part. When you do this, you need to save and then we need to enable it and we'll fill this out again. So again, we'll say long content, subscribed, and we'll change it just in case to say none. And we filled it out. That's good. We're going to go look here. Now, one of the things that they have is, is this little kind of executions you can see. And you can see here it says success. So that's great. So we've got two here that say success. So basically it said a subscribe poll. It came through. It worked with success. So let's just go look at our database here. And again, we'll just look at the count. We can see we've got two items, so that should be the two last things that I did. I'm just going to hit, oops, I didn't grab everything. And we'll look here. And yeah, so we can see we've got a true for short content and a true for subscribed and an all content. And then we've got a true or a long content. We've got one for short content, one for subscribed and one for none. So now I'm starting to collect up statistics to kind of see what's happening on my channel and whether people, you know, want that kind of data, want this kind of information. And we've, it's all running through N8N. So it starts at base row, which is really fast. This, this took no time at all to set up this little poll, create this form and push it out into a nice URL that I can go and just basically keep keep going. I can paste this as a link somewhere for you guys to go fill out and see what you think of it. And in fact, I'll paste this link 
into the show notes in the description and then you guys can go fill this out and I'll collect up some data in my SQL and maybe make some scripts and stuff and we'll see how N8N handles it. But then I went into N8N and I created a workflow pretty quickly here that I had a webhook, I set it up, I did set and I said okay let me grab these values and, and say what I want them to look like and then I connected that to a MySQL piece and said hey let's do it. Now this I had to mess with a little bit because of the way NADN handles faults so maybe they could look at that and try to figure out what's going on there. It's kind of weird but um, yeah when you have boolean values it'd be nice to put it into a boolean MySQL but it wasn't taking it because it was ignoring the false values unfortunately. But there we go. We've got that and it's going into a MySQL database. I've activated it so it's running. It's just listening in the background all the time and there's really nothing else to do. And then I can create more workflows and they have tons of stuff here. So I want you guys to kind of look at all the things they have for, for workflows here. So they've got data transformation. They've got files. So this is probably the node that I need to use something from one of these. So I'm using the set right now, but one of the other transformers might be better. I don't know. But they've got files, so if you click on files, look at all these things you can do with different files and file formats. And then you've got basically flow and hotkeys, but then you've got suggested nodes. So if you click on that, it'll open up suggested nodes. And here we've got cron, we've got if, so you can have an if node, so we can drag this out here. And basically you can say, if I'm gonna, if I have one thing, you know, out of here, what do I expect and what do I want it to do? And if I have another thing out of here, what do I expect and what do I want it to do? So it's pretty, pretty easy to set up like a, if I get a true, go do this thing. If I get a false, go do that thing. Or if something is in the US, go do it this way. If it's in Europe, go do it that way. If it's in Canada, go do it that way. There's all different kinds of ways that you can do things in here. So I mean, pretty, pretty cool um, that, that they have that. So I, I threw this in here. I don't want it in here though. I'm going to delete it. Um, but then you've got even more stuff. So on the, under these suggested nodes, they've got item lists. Again, the set node, they've got Slack. So if you guys use Slack, you've got some great options for Slack there that you can go do with some really, really cool automations instead of Rocket Chat. I like the Rocket Chat automation myself. But then they've got analytics. So you've got all kinds of things you can do with analytic tools and push things over to analytics tools that you've got. Data and storage. So if you're trying to store things out on the cloud or in other types of databases, I mean, just look at the this is a freaking ridiculous long list of databases that you can do stuff with. So this is really cool for setting up a way to get data out of one system and push it over to another system. And I actually went and coded up an entire thing for my wife's eBay data that she downloads every month. And I'm really thinking about going and getting it so that she just downloads that CSV, pulls it into here and let me deal with it from N8N and let N8N push it over into the database that I need it in and really doing it that way because we use Metabase to actually look at that data and those statistics every month and we use it at the end of the year for tax time and I think this would be a really cool tool for that as well. Um, yeah, so Google Drive, I mean just so many things that you've got here, oh my gosh, this is just an insane list, so that's awesome. We start talking about development, okay, here's all the development tools that they've got that you can send data to, you can pull data from, you can do different things using webhooks, again, you can do API, they've got all kinds of stuff, I mean just look at this, look at this list of things that just all deal with development now. Not all this stuff is about coding specifically, some of these things like I saw GitLab up there, GitHub, those kind of things, you're going to send it to GitHub or you're going to have a GitHub, you know, CI build or something like that, but then there's webhooks. Finance and accounting, so again, just tons and tons of things for finance and accounting, which I think is pretty awesome. There's some PayPal stuff if you use PayPal for anything. Marketing and content, just so much stuff here. I mean, I'm not a marketing or content, I'm a content person, but I'm not a marketing content kind of person. Productivity, so a lot of apps for productivity. I mean, just check this out. I mean, all these things, all these integrations that they've got, and they keep adding to this over time. So as they go with this, and I've shown you how to set this up in Docker, you just go and run Docker Compose up or docker compose pull and then docker compose up dash d and you're going to get the updated versions as they push out new updates with new kind of features which is really great i mean this is just such an easy thing to set up and it's such a really great tool i mean this is just amazing so i hope you guys enjoyed this video i hope you'll get a lot out of n8n and get out there and start playing with it and learning about it again they've got a really great tutorial series on how to use the entire product that i would suggest that you go and watch they've got some great documentation that tell you how to use things go check that out as well but I hope you'll like this. I hope you like that we mixed in base row with it from the last video. I really enjoy N8N. I'm liking what I'm seeing. I'm going to put this poll out there for you guys to go and check out. So just definitely check out the show notes. Uh, check out the description. I'll put it also out there on just on the community on, on YouTube so you guys can, can grab it and kind of try it out and see. We'll see how it does. And I'll let you know what the, stat, what the stats look like after I get it done. So hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, like, subscribe, tell your friends about it so they can come along the journey with us. And I'll talk to you next time.